back for this final session and going to be a good one. So I'm glad you've stuck with us the majority of the day. If you've had to jump off, uh, we certainly understand that hopefully you can catch any of these sessions that you missed on demand, but this is going to be a good one. So thanks for sticking with us. Uh, I am once again, Brett Norton with Beyond Clean, and I'd like to extend a big thank you to our event sponsor, Asculat, for making this day of education possible. Uh, we certainly appreciate the sponsorship and really enjoy having that partnership with Asculat. We'd also like to thank our event collaborators, First Case and Power Supply, for bringing forth uh, some the nursing credits and also involving the power supply team. So thank you guys for all of your help. All right, our speaker for this next session is Mr. Nestor Hernandez. Nestor is the Director of Education and Quality for Sterile Processing at Specialty Care. He is a well-known public speaker. I'm sure you've seen him out there at various events. He also spoke at HSPA this year he is a mentor and motivational speaker who thrives on promoting others to be successful in the sterile processing industry. Presentation title is Sustainability at the Forefront, a New Approach for Sterile Processing Professionals. It's time we brought sustainability to the forefront, and this session will do just that, but with a twist. Nestor is joining us to bring forth a solution that will illuminate how sterile processing and operating room professionals can lead the charge in adopting and promoting sustainable practices. This session will leave you inspired to transform your everyday operations into a model of eco-friendly efficiency. All right, here we go, everybody. Last session, let's welcome Nestor to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great opportunity uh, to be part of this topic that I got to tell you, I, I've been in sterile processing now for 42 years, and, and I have a confession to make. Let's start off with, you know, just being honest. This is a topic uh, that I avoided for many, many years. I avoided this topic for many, many years. And, and probably it's because I didn't spend the time to understand how it actually impacts the sterile processing department. I always thought this was a topic that was for discussion at ARN, which this year it was presented at the conference, the, the expo at ARN, but never had I had the thought that, you know, how can we apply this into the sterile processing world? So I start off by confessing, but it wasn't until Askelab asked me to present this presentation at um, HSPA and man, I was, blown, blown away and took a lot of knowledge back home. So here we are today at this platform with Beyond Clean and Askelap and all of you. Uh, so I thank you for hanging out and being part of this, but let's, let's just dive, um, dive right into it. That's me. That's my contact information. As Brad um, mentioned, I am the Director of Education and Quality for Sterile Processing with a company called Specialty Care out of Brentwood, um, uh, Tennessee. Enough of me, right? Upon completion of this, uh, of this activity, you're gonna be able to understand a little bit more. Let's get into some of the objectives, right? Explain the environmental impact of waste and the eco cost profile in the operating room. Identify sustainability initiative in the operating room and also in sterile processing setting to minimize some of this waste. So start thinking about in my department, what can I do to minimize waste? What is what is waste? What, what are we doing, right? And what can we do to make so, to make some changes? And sometimes the thought process is um, I'm not in leadership. I'm not the leader. And just this week, I was talking at a conference about leadership and the overwhelming effects of leadership and what is a leader. And sometimes we think that leadership is having the title of the leader that goes along with the pay. 
but leadership it's someone that demonstrates the enthusiastic um, uh, approach of caring, of wanting to make a difference, to make a change in the organization, to participate with the goals of the organization, policies and procedures, and wanting to do something different, something positive for our patient. We're going to describe barriers and solutions for implementing sustainability. Right off the bat, I believe that the first thing that we always try to um, uh, to create as a barrier is we don't have enough money. That's not enough money for us to pay to do the things that they're asking us to do. So here we are, right? Climate, climate changes is crucial, crucial, crucial in the in global public health. And it's, um, it's a thread of the 21st century with a profound implication on nearly every aspect of life. Number one, pollution resulting from the greenhouse uh, gas emission is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. And it attributes to 9 million premature death in 2015, or 16% of all death worldwide. Number two, the direct costs related to health care, it's almost between $2 billion to $4 billion a year, and it's increasing by 2030. So according to the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Changes, effective actions needs to include transition in the land, the landfill, right? And we're going to show you some pictures of what that really looks like. If you ever, um, never, ever been at a landfill, we're going to show you some pictures so you can see what it looks like. Transport. Cities that reduce population generated emission or carbon dioxide. It says that approximately 45% from the level seen in 2010 to 2030, cutting the greenhouse uh, emission to uh, as close to zero as possible by 2050. So all that to say we have a lot of work that needs to be done within the next couple of years. We're going to talk about some of these points, some of the goals in the perioperative department, right, to provide safe and effective patient care. This goal is not only just for perioperative services. I believe this goal is also for us in the sterile processing department. Let us not forget us, right? The sterile processing department. We work together collaboratively as a team with the perioperative department. And our number one goal is to do that, to provide safe and effective patient care. Number two, to reduce the risk of infection. Man, and I could pause right there and I could tell you stories that are related to my own family members. And, and maybe you you hear in my voice, you know, passion. Well, yeah, there's passion because I understand this reduction of infection when our patients come to our facility. They want the best practice. My mom is 84 years old. She has had a total of 10 total knee on her right knee. Until today, and I just saw mom yesterday, till today, mom still has an infection on her right knee. What went wrong? But that's a total other subject, right? My daughter is 41 years old. My daughter has undergone, undergone nine surgical procedures on her abdomen. She went in for a partial hysterectomy, and she walked out with a colostomy bag. Something went wrong, and today she has infection in her, in her intestine at 41 years old. My daughter is total on total disability. Again, that's another total subject that we can talk about. But man, this is my passion. What else can we do to reduce the risk of infection? The question is, what went wrong? What happened? Was it improperly sterile? Was it uh, improperly packaged? Was the package compromised that caused, man, that's so many questions that we don't know. Next, to provide sterile surgical instrument. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of these. Listen to some of these stats that are going on right now. Perioperative services are considered primarily the energy consumers and the waste producers in an operating room in a healthcare facility. In particular, can use up to six times more energy and generate more than half of the hospital's waste the operating room. 
supply chain, right? Products used to complete procedures, the energy used to include electricity, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, use of inhalation on aesthetics and waste production. Pollution generated by healthcare, it's essential, a matter of patient safety, and it is important for healthcare professionals to understand why and how to adapt environmental performances as part of the quality performance. So we're gonna go into some of these areas, conserve energy, reduce waste, and eco-friendly deliver. Let's dive into some of these. So green initiative, it turns, it aims to preserve and improve environmental by leveraging sustainability, eco-friendly and environmentally conscious practices and alternatives. Green initiative in healthcare facilities have been around for decades following the uh, of the emergence of the environmental movement and began with adopting modest practices like recycling can. Sustainability initiative can not only add value by reducing negative health and environmental impact, but value healthcare dollars can also be saved. So listen to this, according to a practice of greenhouse, 36, the 331 healthcare facility that submitted data to the greenhouse in 2020 environmental excellence, it says the following, that awards collectively, everyone working together, saved $103.8 million on sustainability initiative. These facilities also reduce more than 127 billion KBTs of energy diverted and 141,000 tons of waste from the landfill through doing what? What do we have to do? Recycling and avoiding 177,000 metric tons of carbon emission, emission through mitigation projects. The OR that implemented environmental initiatives save over $72.4 billion total with an average saving of over $1 billion per facility. That's a lot of money. So how do we do some of these things when we talk about energy, when we talk about water, when we talk about commission? Let's get into energy. Reducing. Energy is efficient and is, um, is using less energy to perform the existing tasks. So how can we use less energy by, um, for, for the existing tasks that we are running or to produce the same result? Because we don't want to make any changes that are going to give us a different result. We want the same result or even better result. Reducing heating and cooling in unoccupied area. If, 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 uh, if you think about when we enter into a restroom and automatically the lights go on and when you leave within seconds, the lights go off or even in our own offices, right? Technology is so advanced that we're able to walk into a room, the lights go on automatically and the moment we walk out of the room, the lights go off. It's funny when I was reading this, it took me to a real quick um, story that I want to share with you guys. You know, my daughter at one point in her life, you know, she was always leaving the lights on, the fans on, the lamps on in her room, and she would walk out, and then I would go right behind her and turn all the lights off. And and we, we would always have this discussion, you know, I keep telling her, you know, honey, why don't you turn off all the lights? She goes, why? I'm going right back in the room. And I'm like, but you're not going right back in the room right now. It's going to take you some time before maybe half hour, 45 minutes. You know the energy that we can save by turning all of those lights off and unplugging the things that we're not utilizing? And she looked at me kind of funny. She's now 41 years old, and she's changed a little bit. She's still leaving some of those lights on. Purchasing energy-efficient office supplies, office equipment, evaluating and repairing the physical separation between interior and ex exterior spaces of our building, you know, talking about insulation, 
are some of these rooms were insulated. You know, if you're able to listen to the conversation that's going on in the room next door, it's obvious that it's not well insulated. So what are the things that we can look at? What kind of initiative that we can take in order to implement changes, again, not to give us a different result, but to give us the same result or even a better result. When we talk about water, eliminating equipment and pipe leaks, minimizing water use for laundry, insulation of hot water system equipment and pipes. I got a great story to tell you here. How many people that are listening right now with the form of just raising your hand, even though I can't see you, but maybe you could put an emoji to say, yep, that was me by lifting up a hand or sending me a hand or a thumbs up. When was the last time, or let's say the question is, you haven't been behind a sterilizer. When was the last time you went behind a sterilizer to see how things are going on behind a sterilizer? I'm going to lift my hand. I was one of those that didn't care about going behind the sterilizer. I always thought facility planning, that is their responsibility, not my responsibility. Oh, I got a thumbs up. There you go. Someone that said, yep, that's me too, Nestor. Until, listen to this, until I had a joint commission. Oh, there, there's some emojis going up. Until I had a, a joint commission come in and a surveyor. And she said, may I go behind the sterilizer? And I'm like, sure. Uh, when I went to open the door, to my surprise, when I, the moment I opened the door, there was a pipe that had a leak. And that water went directly to the surveyor and wet her from head to toe. And I froze. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't leave the door open purposely. I, I, I just froze. I was so embarrassed, didn't know what to do. I closed the door right away. And then she looked at me soaking wet and she said, well, what are we going to do about this? And I told her, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get you dried up. OK, I was trying to be funny. I almost told her, you know, you, you could probably just step right into our dryer and, and stand in our dryer just for a little bit. But I didn't dare go there. We got it dried up and call facilities. Facilities came out and took care of the problem. But that, that was my experience, right? So are we checking? It's the same thing in our homes. Um, we have, if we have basements that the pipes are all exposed, you know, are those pipes insulated, right? The hot water insulated. Why do we do that? To maintain, right, the temperature of that water in the pipes, which makes the hot water heater works less, right? Commission initiative examining equipment to determine whether it is functional as needed. Is the equipment working the way it should be working? All right, this is another way to consider sustainability in the healthcare setting. While the green initiative focused more on individual processes, think about commissioning um, um, assesses, a, how a broad range of system work together, including heat, ventilation and air conditioning, fire protection, lighting, the plumbing, medical gas system. Retro commissioning is applying this process to existing facilities and enables opportunity to correct the problem. You're saying, Nestor, but what does this have to do with me? Let's talk about collaborating with those teams that are gonna make us successful you know, working with the operating room, working with facility planning, working with the manufacturer of the instrumentation to ensure that the PMs are being done, evaluating the building, right? That's fire safety features to ensure they function as designed, assessing medical system, your medical gas system to ensure that they have optimum utilities. Supply chain. And I think this is a really hot topic with supply chains. It's a major contributor to green healthcare institution. And it's the ability to leverage supply chain to make sustainability purchases over time, right? Are your supply aligned with the same sustainable solution? That's a question to ask. Are we online or are our suppliers online with our goals? An organization's supply chain can have a major effect on sustainability. 
supply chain efficiency is the capacity to use resources, technology, and expertise to minimize costs and maximize the benefits. So one of the things that we have looked about, uh, looked for in, in the past is reprocessing single use, in, uh, single use items. Single use items that we're not able to reprocess in our facility, but there are third party reprocessors out there that are able to collect the instrumentation. And I could think about a couple of different companies that I've worked with in the past where we collect the instruments, put it in a bucket, put a label on it, ship it back to the company. Then the, comp the company will go on ahead and reprocess the instrument. We can buy those instruments back at a lower cost and the repackaging is actually totally different than the original packaging. And think about the money that we save and how efficient that could be. It's a great initiative when it comes to supply chains. Choosing reusable textile for gowns, drapes, and towels. Well, when I read this, I was like, oh, you mean we should go back to when we were using the linen back in the days? Yeah, and I, I was part of that era. When we were using the linens back in that time, putting on the table with light just to make sure there's no holes on the linen, putting like a bicycle patch on it, and using that to wrap trays and reprocess trays and over and over and over again, utilizing those textiles. Recycling fluorescent lights, recycling batteries, recycling um, the cuffs. There is so much out there that we as a sterile processing department could look at what can I do in order to stick to sustainability and be part of the forefront forefront in what we want to do to make a change. Eco cost profile, totally of economic cost of emission and use of material during the life cycle from production to disposal, right? Measure the quantity of the environmental burden of products and or services based on the prevention that, um, that create a burden. Compare the sustainability of different products and or services with the same functionality. Again, we don't wanna make any changes that are gonna change how things currently function or how they're gonna give us a different result. In other words, it is taking the sustainability of a product into the overall cost equation and supply chain. Waste efficiency an initiative. So some of the things that we could do is developing or enhancing an organization recycling program. See the battery icon on the far left hand side, reducing regulated medical waste generation, right? Implementing a battery recycling program. We're going to discuss some of these in the following slides. Impact of waste. This is just a small picture of what some of our wasteland really looks like. Global waste is on a target to nearly triple by 2060 if we don't take action. Half of the waste ends up where? In the landfill. Significant amount of waste have accumulated, accumulated in aquatic environment. When, when, when I read this, it, it took me back to a commercial. It was a vehicle commercial. This gentleman, I believe it was in one of the East Coast uh, beaches in Florida. He took his pickup truck and in the back of the pickup truck, he created this um, metal like a big uh, rake. And he, uh, he applied it to the back of his truck and he would just drive up and down, I think it was Daytona Beach, and he would drive up and down the beach, just raking his way through the sand and collecting all of the waste trash that people leave behind when they visit our beaches. And, and man, when I saw that and I read this, I was like, you know what? We should have had a picture of this guy there because he has really taken it to a total different level to implement changes so that this does not occur. It says, let me read something to you really, really quick, that according to the Organization of Economics, Corporation and Development, the amount of waste produced globally is on target to triple to 2060, like I mentioned, with approximately half of the waste ending up in 
landfill and less than a fifth, 15% being recycled. That's something for us to really, really put some thought behind it. Look at this. The high volume waste comes from OR, hospitals, right? 6,600 metric tons of waste per day. The operating room estimates 20 to 50% of that number from any hospital. Regulated medical waste and non-hazardous uh, waste. Hospital in the U.S. generate, like I mentioned, 6,600. Regulated medical waste, RMW, healthcare-related waste, with the hospital's potential to spread diseases through blood, bodily fluid, or other types of contamination if not handled properly. So it's not just put it in a red bag and ship it out somewhere. It's how we're handling this to protect our healthcare workers, and also to protect the environment. Contaminated items are defined as waste that would release blood or other potential infectious material in a liquid or semi-liquid state if compressed. This waste cannot be recycled and are mostly incinerated. Food for thoughts, right? So what are some of the waste that we see in an OR, right? Think about all of the paper. Think about all the cardboard from all of the supply chain materials that we utilize. Everything that we're opening up, setting up the operating room. Think about the metal, the glass. Think about the blue wrap. Right? Think about the medication. When we think about blue wrap, think about all these different uh, hospitals that have or that do a lot of total needs. And we're getting 75 to 80 trays that we must wrap for our procedure for maybe for one physician. And out of all of those wraps, how many of those trays do they really open? Maybe 10, maybe 12. So we need to start thinking a little bit smarter. What can we do? Maybe put some of those trays on consignment and containerize those trays, having conversation with the physician. And I'm speaking to you from experience. This is something that's always been very close to my heart listening to the employees complaining, all of that work that we put into putting all those trays together. And now we got to handle all those trays again because they did not use those trays. What is the cost associated? It's in the hundreds. It's in the thousands, right? When you think about the water consumption, when you think about the supplies, when you think about steam, when you think put all that together, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So what can we do differently? right, that would help the sustainability, but not just help the sustainability to sustain what we're trying to do, but also to make the job easier for our staff. Environmental concerns um, in, uh, of the, operating, uh, in the operating room. So what is the huge concern with this shift to plastic type of material? Unfortunately, some of those desirable qualities are become or they become, they also become a limitation. For example, plastic are highly resistant to physical and chemical um, degradation. And um, polypropylene can take up to 30 years to degrade naturally. Although most wastes eventually end up in a landfill, waste used for patient care must be treated first. The choice of treatment can be influenced by the cost. Everything is influenced by the cost, right? Transport, the distance, and local or national regulation. Incineration is the most effective technique. More environmentally friendly treatment option exists. However, they have um, verified effectiveness, and incineration is the only technique that can treat all forms of waste high resistant to physical and chemical degradation. Medical waste must be treated before going to a landfill. Incineration process is highly toxic. There's a couple of charts that I put together. Optimizing sustainability is, is linked with a circular economy, economy right? Um, the existing healthcare economy is dominated by linear right, processes, 
where goods are produced, used, and ultimately discarded, right? We'll look at figure A. This way, this one-way flow has a distinctive beginning and an end, and an end such as with the single-use disposable product. Now, a circular economy works differently and it's more sustainable. It closes the loop of the linear, right? Take, make, consume, throw away pattern by retaining the high utility and value of the product components and material for as long as possible. So with the circular economic activity, waste is reduced to a minimum because everything produces, everything produced is transfer and used somewhere else continuously. Right? Something to think about. For example, syringes that are open and unused interoperatively must be discarded at the end of the procedure as an infection control and prevention measure. This is a common practice that leads to, per, that leads to, that leads to um, pervasive, if the, if the word, amount of waste, right? Uh, uh, also discarded without the use and waste up to 25% when we're talking about an anesthesia drug budget, right? So instrument packaging, blue wrap, pros, initial costs, flexible and imp impermeable, historical processes, blue wrap, cons, waste, right? So this is the, the con is a waste, sustainable to tear, sterility and ability to stack trays on top of the other. But I'm sure that if we were to visit some of our facilities, you know, we're still stacking trays, one on top of the other, one on top of the other. And then what happens when we need the tray that's at the bottom, we always want to do like, like, like the, um, the table trick, right? The tablecloth trick, right? Where the table is all set up with the dishes and the plates and, and, and also with, with the forks and spoon. And we try to pull on the tablecloth without anything falling down. Man, I've seen this years and years and years. I need the tray that's at the bottom and all the trays are wrapped. And we try to pull on that tray and we pray that it doesn't tear, that the sterility is not compromised, right? So there is, there is cons with, with blue wrap. So RCS, when we're talking about containerizing, very minimal waste, one-time purchase, lasting many years, and they are stackable. Containers, the cons, upfront investment, right? Everything is going to cost some money, right? Let me go to the next one. Here's a couple of solution, right? Let's talk about a couple of sustainable solution. Is the item essential to the care uh, that we're providing? That's a good question to ask. Is there an alternative that is well proven? Which alternative supports lower use of material, generation of waste and cost? Instrument packaging. So it's a case study that was done. Right? Evaluation of the procedure mixed trays, storage, the space, sterile processing capacity, current quality concern, the true cost per use and over duration of containers, right? And ego costs, breaking down the point, 68 sterilization cycles, right? Containers 84% less ego costs over 5,000 cycles, six times less cost, ego costs, for containers over a blue wrap. And I know what we're thinking. We're thinking that's a lot of money. You know, container, if I wanna buy X amount of containers, we we're probably talking about 40, 50, $60,000 and probably even a lot more than that. Some containers manufacturers uh, have designed um, containers for sterilization that align with greenhouse initiative. For example, some containers not only eliminate the use of sterile blue wrap to reduce waste, but they also made a 41% more than one third of recycled low carbon aluminum. 
44 aluminum is circular material and can sustain multiple recycling without losing its original property. Blue wrap is generally less expensive. However, it requires frequent replacement. I will share a story of something that we did at one of our facility with sustainability with the blue wrap. We worked together with a local high school, with the sewing department of the local high school. And what we did was we started collecting all of the blue wraps that were not used or blue wrap that it had a hole and now we can't use it or blue wrap that I put the tray together and I forgot the instrument and I'll have to pop the tray again, right? We're not supposed to use that, tra that, that wrap again. So we started collecting all of these wraps, including in the operating room, and we would deliver the wraps to the local high school and the sewing department would then put together string bags. And then we would collect those string bags and fill them up with non with cans, goodies, you know, food, hygiene products, and then we would take it to a local organization where they were distributed among the homeless people in our community. And, and you can look that up. That is actually a made it to the news. The name of the high school was Deer of High School in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Great, great story and how we were able to apply, right, the recycling of these RAB to do something positive within our community. Sterile blue wrap can puncture, we know that. It can rip during the handling and compromise the instrument sterility, right? We do event related, event related has a lot to do with it's sterile until it is compromised. It's sterile until it is compromised. And compromise means you drop it on the floor, it's compromised. Compromise means it's been sitting on the shelf and those black lines on the wrap are no longer black. They kind of magically faded away. Hmm. Maybe it's time to take those instruments, have a conversation with the OR specialist that oversees that specialty and say, are we using these instruments? And if not, then let's get rid of them. But if we are using them, can we put them in a container to maintain the sterility of this package? Because we're getting kind of tired of re-sterilizing these instruments almost every two years, right? So we need to slow things down in our department and pay attention to our surrounding because I'm telling you, when I thought that we did not understood or were part of this program sustainability without having the knowledge, we were, we were actually doing it. We were actually doing it without understanding it. Imagine now with the knowledge how much more we can do. So in summary, by going green, the healthcare facilities can have a positive effect on population health, right? Clear air reduces the um, incidence of disabilities and illness by creating clear air. Reducing hazardous chemical waste lowers the risk of potential harmful microorganisms into, into our systems. Healthcare facilities can save millions of dollars by being environmental conscious. And maybe some of that, those dollars will end up in our pockets. Who knows? Surgical care results in waste production, right? Acknowledge, hey, you know what? That's me. I'm the one that's producing the most waste in my department. And take responsibility and say, what can I do to change this mindset? All our contributors um, this proportionally to this ways and an opportunity is to focus on sustainability intervention. Thank you for attending this continuing education presentation. Thank you Beyond Clean and Askalaf for allowing me to participate. It's been an honor. I want to turn it right back to Brett and see if anyone has any, any questions. All right. Nestor, thank you so much. That was very good, very informative. Uh, I, I loved your, um, your story about your daughter and the lights. Um, <laughs> my, my dad used to, we used to go around the house and turn up the heat. <laughs> and he was <laughs> always known for turning that heat dial down, saying you can just put on an extra shirt or an extra sweatshirt. That's so, right. That's right. You know, 
I think that all correlates to just the small amount of effort and personal sacrifice that we can all make in terms of just delivering more uh, in the way of sustainability and actions to to ultimately help in the long run. Because if we're ignoring the problem now, it's going to be a much bigger problem in the future. Later on, that's right. It's going to be more expensive. And it's also going to cost uh, way more in terms of patient care, health care. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, people look at recycling, sustainability, and oftentimes dollar signs start floating. Oh, man, this mm-hmm. is going to be expensive. And how do we implement these programs? Because it's it's we've got to do the the data analysis we've got to look in terms of what we can do we've got to pay somebody to do these but do these analytical programs but if you think about that on the front end if you're doing it now it's it it, it'll cost way less in the future and as you referenced Mm -hmm. it's going to save hospitals and healthcare systems billions of dollars Mm -hmm. and end up hopefully back in our pockets. In our pockets, that's right. <laughs> um, so any, anybody that's out there right now, we do encourage some Q&A. Uh, we are live, so please throw in your questions. We love for Nestor to take a crack at answering those. Um, Nestor, I've got a question for you as mm-hmm. far as, you know, when, when you look at the big picture and seeing, wow, this is, this is a monster program to implement for us to get to that point of saving millions of dollars. Um, you know, we always think in terms of, of, you know, starting small, start small, think big. Um, do you have examples of small steps facilities can take to begin implementing sustainable programs? Mm-hmm. One of the first thing that that I did, and again, I, I have to say this, I, I I did it because I saw an opportunity, but not because I understood, you know, this topic. And and um, there was a conference many years ago in Washington D.C. in reference to sustainability, and I went there. So the first step was to educate myself, to understand, to educate myself. The second step for me was to, and the way that I did it, I stood in the middle of my department and I started slowing my pace down a little bit and observe my surroundings because we get so engaged into what we do every day. You know, we're firefighters, we're counselors, we're we're getting called into the OR, the staff is coming into our office because of issues and we get so involved in that and our brain gets so trained to just focus on that that sometimes we got to pull back a little bit and look at our surroundings. And that's what I did. I started looking at my surroundings. One of the things that I started doing, one of the things that I did was I put tickets in to change the lightings in all our offices so that when we walked out, automatically shut off. All right. The other thing that we did was if you're at your workstation and you're going on your 45 minutes break, Turn the lights off at your workstation. Don't leave the don't, don't leave the lights on. Turn it off. The other thing that we did was we were used to at a certain time, like at midnight, turn the sterilizers off before we left for the day. And then we 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 work with facility planning to understand how how mechanically how all of that works. And it was costing more power, more work. Uh, six o'clock in the morning when the machines were down from 11 in the evening all the way to six in the morning to turn them back on and get them ready for them to be at the right chamber temperature in order to start doing our testing. So it was more efficient for us to just leave them on, but always kept the doors closed in the sterilizer. And even between loads, even between loads, you know, we Pull the load out and close the door. Close the door because that helped maintain the temperature in the in the chamber. And therefore, when you hit start, the, the, the chamber didn't have to start heating up. It was already hot. And your cycles were, the time of the cycles were less time than what it took to heat up that chamber to then go through all of the different conditions. There's some of the things, and then what I spoke about with the CS wrap, collecting the CS wrap. And, and, and talking to people 
and using those RAF for the purpose of string bags. So, yeah. But, but, yeah. but what it took was education, understanding, and slowing down a little bit and observe your surroundings and see, because there is an opportunity. But unless you slow it down, you're not going to see it. Right. Yeah, those are all great examples of small steps you can take, mm -hmm. you know, just the simple action of flipping the light switch off when you're going on break. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've often heard, you know, there's the energy discussion is is widely is out there all over the place. Um, but we get, you know, on the personal side, I'm often told we're told not to just shut down our air conditioning if it's, you know, if it's going too, too high, too fast or because if you do, then it takes that much longer to, and that much more energy to right. pump it back up. Like so, the sterilizer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. I think that there's that managing piece of uh, and and getting educated on that on the front end of okay, well we can just shut the door and mm -hmm. we'll save that much more energy. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and it's about Brent. It's about sharing that information with your staff. Right. Not just to go to the staff and say, close that door. Why you got that door open? Yeah. You know, make it an educational, um, allow them to participate and feel that they are part of this solution. You know, exactly. the why's. Why do we do the things that we do? Well, this is the reason why. Work with facility planning, get your data, get your numbers so they can show to them what is the cause of the water that we're utilizing in our departments that are going right down the drain. But if we use reverse osmosis, right, and we reuse that water behind the sterilizer, putting water filtration systems that we use that same water over and over and over and over again to save on the usage of water, right? Uh, so these are things that we need to just have conversation with those that probably have more knowledge than we do. But please, Make sure you're going behind those sterilizers and paying attention to what's happening behind the sterilizers. <laughs> yeah, I've actually, in my days on the vendor side, I've taken a peek behind mm -hmm. the sterilizers and just, I mean, there's a lot there and just the, all of the operational components and everything that goes into that. There, I, and to your point, having the understanding of the overall process mm -hmm. and not just saying, we need to do this. Right. And, you know, the educational piece is really, really uh, something to enforce and the mm -hmm. showing, not telling and the right. why behind the how. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that those those are great points. Um, I got a question here from David. What changes that you implemented, you know, maybe the couple that you just discussed had the fastest results? The fastest result changes was the uh, CS wrap. That was the fastest one. Hmm. And, I, and I guess it was the fastest one um, only because of the end result, right? We probably didn't make any money out of that, but that wasn't the intent. The, the best result that we got out of that is that we worked together with our community and they were able to come in to understand our jobs and what do we do. And then from there, working collaboratively together to supply the need into our community. And you know what came out of that? What came out of that was that the, the school created a program. They created a program, and the program is called, still running today, Building 21 here in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Students that were interested in the healthcare setting we gave them permission to come and visit our facilities and spend time in different departments, radiology, mm -hmm. sterile processing, uh, the emergency room, and grants were created. So here we started with a simple solution of CS wrap to supply a need to our homeless community. And then because we share our knowledge, these teachers and administrators that have visit our facility say, hey, why don't we put together a program to share more of that knowledge? And still today, um, it's been very, very successful. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think that the more understanding you can buy in as people are developing in the healthcare mm -hmm. system and, and um, you know, it's, it's always great to educate 
before there's an issue and for them to come in ready to make a change. So that's mm -hmm. great. Um, you talked about consolidation of trays and you gave an example in the OR of, of reduction of trays. And we mm -hmm. talked about it with Peter Nickel earlier in the conference today. But can you elaborate a little bit more on how you mm -hmm. implemented that program? Uh, you know, obviously identifying instruments that the surgeons are using more frequently than not or not at all. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. would you mind uh, shedding a little bit of light on that? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. We, we had a physician like you all have that felt that he needed 70 plus trays for his procedures throughout the day. And, and it was 70 plus trays will come in. And as you know, the work that it entails from decom prep and pack and, you know, wrapping all of these trays, sterilization, delivery to the, of the products. And we were actually delivering to two different facilities, the local facility, plus we were also, we had to purchase trucks, right, to deliver clean products to the facility and then to bring everything back. And at the end of every day that we had 70 plus tray, we probably only used 12, maybe 13. So how, what do we do? So we started, um, putting data together. What was the cost associated with putting 72 trays together? You know, uh, each tray was an average of almost $125, $140. You multiply that times 72 trays. Okay, you use 12, deduct that. This is what we have left. So the first initial approach was that if you don't use all 72 trays, we're gonna charge, right, the vendor for those trays that were not utilized, right? Uh, that was smart thinking, but it did not work. Right? <laughs> so the next thing that we did was let's have a meeting with the doctor. We sat with the doctor. And the great part about the story is that this physician started in sterile processing many, many, many years ago. I had no clue about that until we opened the doors in our department and invited him to come down for a conversation. He was in sterile processes, so he understood. And he goes, Nestor, I understand, but what is the solution? I go, what if we do a consignment? That the trays will always be here. We'll containerize them. So we did our diligent investigation. Can these instruments go in a container? Are they validated? Yes, they were. So we moved on forward. He said, if you can find the space, Go on ahead. So I ask him for a list. What do you feel that you need here on a weekly or on a daily basis to do the procedures that you're doing? He gave us the list. We work with the company. We got those consigned. We work with supply chain. I mean, there was a lot of people involved. It just wasn't just wasn't me and the doctor and the vendor, you know, because what if uh, we have a fire in the department? These trays that are in consignment, they don't belong to us. What is it going to cost? So we had a lot of different departments involved and we were very successful in identifying what the need was and having those trays in our facility sterile at all time. And we, we, we got at least two to three of each kind in the event that there was an issue. We put count sheets together, we got the IFU, we took pictures of the instruments, so we were able to turn these instruments around a lot quicker. And the ending of the story was very successful because we no longer had to um, process all of those instrumentations. So think about the savings. If it came in for one toe or knee or hip and he used X, Y, and Z trays, the other thing was the amount of instruments that were in those sets. So we went from 72, and I think it was like 22, 23 trays, but now let's look at those trays. Do we need all of these instruments? Because some trays had the same instrument, mm -hmm. you know, uh, duplicated in other sets. So that was another conversation with him. So we took all of the trays, we laid them all out, and we had him walk through each tray and say, I don't need this instrument, remove it. I don't need this instrument. This instrument is in that tray. By the time we, he was done, we were able to compile a tray that we knew that every instrument in that set was going to be utilized. We redid the count sheets. 
the company where vendor work with us that remove all of those instruments. So now we're not even paying for those instruments that are in the set. We're only responsible for the instruments that were in our set on consignment. Very successful. It started in one. So remember, I said at the beginning, we were supplying vendor trays to two different um, hospitals, right, within our organization. So we started at the main campus. And then from there, we started doing the same project with our uh, sister hospital and implemented the same process. Very, very successful. And it's huh. still running after I was there for 10 years. I left two years ago and it's still very, very successful. That's amazing. And I think, you know, not only is it cost savings, it's moving towards the sustainable side, but it's more efficient. You know, mm -hmm. the workflows are more collaborative. Um, you know, I think we also talked a little bit about collaboration and what you highlighted there was, you know, supply chain, the OR, everybody working together for a common goal. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, you know, the thought of collaboration, but then there's also the integrative piece mm -hmm. in having all departments working on a level plane to come up with a solution that benefits solution. everybody. Right. That's, so, right. that's right. Yeah, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a great example. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Um, I'll throw one more question at you and then I'll let mm -hmm. you go on okay. a Friday. Uh, but how can SPD work in tandem? This goes to just what we were talking about. Work in tandem with the OR and supply chain to make a case for standardizing sustainable programs. That's real easy. Invite yourself to their meetings. Mm. Invite yourself to their meetings. They're not going to know unless you share. So that's one of the things that I did in this same facility. The first thing that I do, so in the 42 years, I've, I've worked probably in five different hospitals. The first thing that I always do is, who is my infection control officer? invite them to come over the department so we could have conversation, right? Establish relationship. And then with the operating room, it was like, when do you do your huddles? I want to be part of the huddles because in your huddles, you're talking about what's going on today, but you're also talking about, about what your needs are tomorrow. So by me knowing what your needs are tomorrow, I think I have a lot more time to be able to implement a, a process to be able that you have everything that you need. And then we started inviting supply chain. So Supp supply chain will come in and have their meeting with the OR prior to sterile processing with the OR. And I just, I, st I, I will see supply chain leaving and then I will come in with my team and I was like, wait a minute, this is, we're repeating the same information over and over again. We're, we're separating these departments when we're supposed to be collaboratively working together. So I went to the director of the OR and I said, Kim, we have one meeting and allow sterile processing to be there. I won't come with my crew. I'll come by myself and have supply chain come in. And that's exactly what we did. Now I'm hearing from supply chains, the vendor trays that are coming in. Now I'm hearing from, from the OR, you know, how many tonsillectomies we're going to do tomorrow. And in my head, it's like we're doing nine what? And we only have five trays. Now I knew my mental note, I have to borrow some trays. But we got to prioritize the first two or three trays. So it, it, again, collaboratively working together. And sometimes you may just have to invite yourself and show up to an uninvited meeting. <laughs> That's great information. And, and uh, I think, you know, the communication piece to uh, more communication and working hand in hand so that the messaging is the same mm -hmm. and not, not the same across multiple departments, that it's a, just an integrated mm -hmm. message. And that, I think, opens up the crystal ball effect, mm -hmm. right, to where right. you can see ahead, you can start planning ahead, you can start working towards these initiatives mm -hmm. to have the hospital working right. more efficiently and um, everybody working together. So, so when, when you think about it, what is the common denominator that we all have? It's our patient. Yep. The patient on that table. That supply chain supplies the supplies. The OR does what they do. Sterile processing does what they do. Anesthesia is also there. So there's all of these different entities that we all share a common 
right goal, and that is for best patient outcome that's out there. So I just wanna end by saying thank you to everyone that's out there, that every single day, you may not understand what your why is, and you get up every morning questioning yourself, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? You know, but just keep doing what you're doing because there is people out there like my mother that depend on all of us. There's people out there like my 41-year-old daughter that's on full disability, right, because of something that went wrong that depends on every single one of you. So on behalf of both of my two ladies that I love with my heart, I just want to say thank you for pushing every day. Slow it down a little bit and look for opportunities to do what we do better. Thank you so much from my heart and my family's heart to your heart. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Nestor. I don't think I can say anything more. You nailed it on the head. So I'm just going to say thank you to everybody as well to, for joining us today. What a what a great day of education and information. Uh, Nestor, I thank you so much for joining us. Um, way to close out this conference. It couldn't have been any better. If thank anybody you. has anything out there for Nestor, feel free to connect with him on LinkedIn. His contact information is on the screen. I uh, would like to sincerely thank our event sponsor, Asculap, and event collaborator, collaborators, First Case and Power Supply. Once again, thank you to our attendees. Uh, SPD certificates will automatically download at the conclusion of the session. Nursing credits will be automatically directed to the event summary and CE certificate following this session. So sessions are now on demand. If you missed anything, please jump back in and watch whatever you miss. It's been a great day. And on behalf of our entire team at Beyond Clean, keep fighting dirty and we'll see you next time. Yes, love that. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.